All right, welcome back to our map reduce teardown here. What do we want to, where do we want to start? How should we start attacking this? I think I might start by going one phase at a time in order. Um, so I'm going to ignore. Uh, oh, I see. Okay, I'm going to ignore the, the map phase. I'm going to ignore the reduce phase, the summary phase. All of this error handling, we're just going to collapse it all so that it can be out of sight and out of mind. For now. And we are just going to focus on get input data. All right. Now, I think I mentioned a couple things that could be refactored. We had hard-coded them. This folder. And initially this, um, not this one, sorry, this. This search ID was hard-coded. I extracted it out into a variable. I think there's an even better way to go about this. We are already leveraging script parameters. And script parameters are very common to use in MapReduce. It's a very helpful, very useful, very practical um, way to kind of configure and control how a certain script operates, script deployment more specifically. So I think since we're already using script parameters, I'm going to leverage more script parameters for these hard-coded and fixed values so that... I can just configure this stuff from the deployment record. Um, so when I go to migrate this uh, script to my production account or to 20 client accounts, um, we can just set up script parameters rather than trying to write some crazy logic to figure out the right IDs or have to rely on some config file or something. Script parameters are a great way to dynamically determine things like this. Um, so we can add... Um, a script parameter that is a saved search field. So on the deployment, you'll just be able to select a saved search in a dropdown list, uh, and that will contain this ID for us. So what I'm going to do, this is a very common pattern I follow. I use script parameters a lot in MapReduces uh, because it's very common that we are loading files or, loading, or reading files from a specific folder, or running saved searches. That is a very common task for a MapReduce to do. So I very often use script parameters for them. And so I have a pretty established pattern for how I go get those. Um, so what I always do is make a new function for, um, and I put it after my, uh, this doesn't matter, but I, I put it after my entry points. I start my utility functions, my, my more specific functions. Uh, so I'm going to have a function. And its only job is to read my script parameters. Um, in order to read script parameters, you need a script. You need to know which script you are reading the parameters from. And I'm going to package them up in an object. That's what we're going to output. So our first script parameter is a search ID. So how about we call it search ID? I'm going to open this back up and copy. Here's how we read a parameter. Oops. Get parameter. Um, there is a file to process, and there will be a third one. Um, so we have a search ID. Uh, the parameter we were already reading was the line of the file search. Um, so this ID, file to process, makes it sound like this is going to be a file ID. Uh, that's not actually what it is. It's an integer representing which um, which index of the search results to read. So I think I might say like file index. You know, I'd probably rename this. Um, and I'm going to do that in my 
in my parameter function as well. So there's a file index. Um, this we would obviously, this would have a different ID, the search ID. So I don't know if this is like, a, what is this, our Mac search. And then the third parameter we want to extract is the folder, this. Um, so we could set this up. I don't think you can specify a folder script parameter field, but you can specify an integer field. Uh, and we could put the internal ID of this folder in that parameter. Um, so this will be the folder ID. So we have a file index. I want a folder ID. Uh, so this will be the completed. And it, so the folder represents, uh, these are the CSVs uh, that have been, all, that have already been processed. Or I suppose at least have been attempted. Okay, so we have three different script parameters. So I, this one already exists. We're already reading that. I'm just moving it into a function. These two I would add, right? I would be adding these new parameters on my, on my script record. Okay, and that's all we want to do. We read our script parameters. We package them up nicely in an object so that we're not constantly calling git parameter because uh, re this is really long and length is lengthy. So let's refactor what we have up here already. Uh, so I no longer need this. This variable is no longer necessary. We Here we get the current script. So right after that, We do something like that. Um, we don't need this line anymore. Uh, line of file search is used right here. That just becomes params, which is where we uh, stored our parameter data. Uh, this is the file index. Okay, so we have replaced the need for this uh, with params.file index. Uh, this becomes params.search ID. That can go on one line. Okay. Um, we never use this current script runtime variable again, so there's no reason for it really when we can just do this. I suppose if you like that alias, if that makes this more readable for you, that's totally fine to leave it. It doesn't hurt anything. It uses a tiny, tiny, tiny bit more memory that will be completely unnoticeable and irrelevant. Um, all right, so I've added a function that, that reads our parameters. So now, um, well, we didn't, uh, we're not done yet. We need to also update the folder ID. So this will be params.folder ID, there. And so now all of this stuff is determined dynamically. Um, we don't have to worry about hard coding IDs. We don't have to worry about IDs changing or when we migrate to a production or whatever. None of that's gonna change. It's all gonna be fixed as long as we set up our deployments correctly in each environment. They will just work, and we won't have to make any code changes. Um, furthermore, I have a little bit less code to read in, in get input data uh, to figure out what's going on. I can pretty well infer that we are reading parameters from the current script from this line. Um, and unless something is going wrong or I actively need to change something in how the parameters are being read, I don't care how this is done, so I don't need to go read this. I can just know that, okay, we're reading some parameters from a script. Great. And then I can move on to what I'm actually looking for. Okay. So we are... The next phase of this is to basically get the contents of the CSV. And I think what I want to do is take all of that, all of that functionality, and turn it into a function as well. So I'm just going to wholesale rip all of that out. And I will come back and put it right there. So we go back down. 
right after our read parameters. So this is a CSV file that contains our MAC addresses. So let's call our function read MAC address CSV. Um, not quite sure yet what the inputs and outputs are. That's okay. Um, okay, so I need to know which search ID. Now I could pass in the entire parameters object, but I don't actually need that. I really just need the search ID. And the index. Those are the only two I really need. Like that, that should be the only inputs we need. Um, and then at the end here, uh, we are parsing CSV, then we're slicing out some of the lines. So CSV is our actual return data. Um, so I basically just kind of cut out a whole block of code. Okay. So I've cut out that entire block of code. I have taken, let's see how long that function is. Um, 13, 40 lines of code, 45 lines of code, and I've pulled that out of the of get input data, which reduces the cognitive load of parsing what get input data does. Again, I can just read and infer from function names. Uh, okay, I am reading parameters from a script, then I am using some of those script parameters to uh, read MAC addresses, read the MAC address CSV. Um, and again, if I don't care, if, if all of the CSV processing and reading is working fine, I can just skip right over this function and keep moving on down the script to find what I do need. Um, and, and that's kind of the pattern we're going to go through is leveraging functions like this to turn, um, this very procedural logic, you know, step by step, here's all the nitty gritty details of what this script is doing. That's not necessary. We can leverage functions to give certain pieces of functionality names, simple readable names, and then just read the names uh, to understand what the script is doing. And then when we need to know, uh, more than a name, when we need to know how the CSV is being read, then we dive into that function and focus on it. But this uh, 50 lines of code or whatever I said is much easier to parse than, say, the whole, you know, 600 lines of code uh, in this file. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, uh, and I really should have, once we've figured out what this is doing, and remember, it took us several hundred lines to do that. There's a really handy place to put an overview of what a script does, and it's right here, right at the beginning. Uh, so this module comment, header comment, is mandatory. You need to, for NetSuite, you need to specify the API version, you need to specify the script type. Those are mandatory, those have to be there. Your script doesn't even upload if you don't do that. So why not also, since it's mandatory, it has to be there, also add some plain English text or whatever language you prefer uh, that describes what this is doing. So we learned that this is a MAC address deduplicator. So um, and you can add as much detail as you want there. Um, you don't need a ton, but a good overview, a sentence or two about what this module is responsible for and maybe a tiny bit about how it does it. That's a very good place to put it right there at the top in the header document that has to be, or header comment that has to be there anyway. Okay. Let's go back to get input data. Um, what do we want to do here? I think searches. Searches are a great candidate for putting into their own functions almost always. Um, Usually you just need a few inputs, some input parameters to specify certain filters, uh, which we'll see here. 
and then you can just return the list of search results. Uh, so they're great candidates for isolating into um, functions. The searches tend to change a lot. We, we like to tweak the criteria a lot or add new columns here and there, or take away columns, whatever it might be. And so having the search uh, fixed and isolated in its own function makes it nice and easy to make those changes. Uh, so let's do that. Let's extract our searches. Uh, we have two of them. Let's extract our searches into uh, their own separate function. Going to collapse our new functions and add a new one. Okay, I almost always, uh, when I write a function that runs a search, I almost always prefix it with find. Uh, that is a huge clue to me that this function runs a search just from its name. I don't have to look at how it's implemented. I just know that, oh, it, it starts with find, so I'm probably running a search. So let's grab all of this search logic uh, just for creating the search, not yet for processing it, just for creating the search. Let's grab that. Mm, no, I changed mine. I am going to add this part as well. So you can see I took everything between these uh, section comments. Those are usually great indicators that, oh, maybe I need a function here. Uh, let's put that at the end. Here's our result processing. Okay. Now let's examine this a little closer. We need uh, an input. Uh, current Mac is not defined in here. It was defined before. So... Let's go grab that. That needs to be our input. Now, current Mac, current doesn't have a lot of meaning in this inside in the context of just this function. So I think I'm just going to refactor this and rename it to Mac address um, because we're basically we are basically calling this function for each Mac address. Um, right here, let's go back, remember. We need to remember to do that search. Uh, so we will put, that's where we will put the function we're writing now to use. Um, okay, I think that's the only input we need. Everything else is defined within this function. Uh, we, we, we will need an output. We will need to return something. But let's look at this search. This is a or this is a very, very verbose way to specify search columns. That is not necessary. Uh, I actually like to declare my columns right in line inside the create method. Um, Let's look at this one first. This is just a simple column. All we need is the name. We're not sorting it, we're not summarizing it. There's no join, nothing like that. It's just a name. All we need to pass into columns for that is the name. No object, just the string of the, the field ID, the column ID, that's it. That is sufficient to get that column. Uh, the next one we'll look at is this one. This one has a join. Uh, it's almost the same. Um, now, usually you don't need to join to get an internal ID. Usually just grabbing the owner column is sufficient. I'm going to leave it like it is uh, using the join, but that's usually not, uh, that's usually a little bit overkill, but that's fine. We can specify joined columns this way, join ID dot uh, column ID. Uh, and I have a whole series of videos and cookbooks uh, on how on more advanced searching techniques and patterns and definitions and all that. So there will be a link uh, somewhere up above you in the video. Um, okay, so we've got our joined column taken care of. We have our normal column. Now we have a column that we're sorting on. This is a little bit more complicated, but not much. Uh, let's go look at...
So if we are looking at um, search dot create for the columns parameter, let's zoom in so you can see it. Uh, one of the things we can pass in is just an object that contains any of these properties. Name is required, the rest are optional. Uh, we're specifying a sort. Um, so we don't actually need to go as far as calling create column and all that. We can basically just kind of rip this, the object that we would pass into create column. We can just uh, basically rip that out and put that straight into the columns array. Uh, I'm going to remove this comment here. Well, I don't have to remove it. I can just put it above. That's fine. Uh, it does not matter what order we specify the columns in. In this case, there are some cases where it does matter, but this is not, they're, they're very rare. Uh, that usually it comes in with grouping. When we start grouping and summarizing things, if we have multiple groups, then order matters. And there's some other cases, but forget about that. Uh, this is sufficient. This is entirely enough to cover what all of this was doing. Um, and it's, it's much shorter. And once you kind of learn this shorthand, it is much more concise. Um, so there's our columns. There's our search. Our search is set up and ready to go. So we're just grabbing three fields off of our record. Um, starts with, let's, again, let's take this and cut uh, starts with is the operator so that searches don't time out is or contains timeout yes contains is a very 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 expensive search operator um text comparison like that trying to find an occurrence of a string anywhere within another string is a very expensive algorithm uh, and so it takes a long time, and yes, often searches time out when they use it. Um, so avoid contains at all costs, especially on large data sets, because it will not work. It will time out, or it will take a long time. Okay, so there's our search. Our search is set up. I'm not sure what we do with count. Probably just log it out. That's fine. Uh, we can do that if we want. That's unnecessary. There's a quicker way to get the count, but uh, it does involve running the search twice, and I won't get into that. Um, okay, so for we have our search set up, then we run it, and we process each result. What do we do? We count, we log, great. We grab the internal ID. Here's where we do all the owner shifting and unshifting. Uh, okay. So really the goal here is to take a search result and turn it into this uh, array string structure. There is probably a better way to go about this. Um, we are basically taking each result and turning it into a data structure that holds a MAC address and a uh, internal ID. What if instead of, of putting that into a string of a specific format and then trying to reparse that string and split it on a comma and do all that noise, uh, how about we just use a native data structure that lets us specify multiple properties? Um, so objects are great for that. So how about we just leverage JavaScript's native objects? So instead of doing all of this, I'm gonna, we're gonna break, kind of make a break here. Um, we are adding all this onto hold array. Now hold array doesn't exist in here. That was defined elsewhere. So what I'm gonna do for now is that, and then I think I'm gonna rename these. Um, I'm gonna rename all these to, oh. Code occurrences. 
this is our these are our Mac results. Okay, so that refactor them all for us, and then at the very end, that will be our output. That's the output of our function. Okay, so in here, we are iterating through our search results. Uh, the first thing I want to do is. See, so we have a MAC address, which we get from, uh, that was getting passed in. It's getting passed in, but it's also the value of this uh, column. So let's get it from the actual search result. Okay. So we want the MAC address, we want the owner ID. Uh, now, because it's joined, we have to specify the join in get value as well. Um, get value does not understand this dot syntax. Uh, so we just specify name and join like so. Uh, what was the other thing? We have the MAC address, we have the owner ID. We also need the internal ID, uh, which I'm just gonna specify as ID. And I'm gonna cheat. Um, I could also do get value name internal ID uh, like this, or I could just use this variable that we're using, but we don't really need to do that. Um, also, there's no join, it's null, so don't you don't need to bother with that. Uh, we also, we were storing this in a variable because we reuse it later according to this comment, which is good, that's a good strategy. But now that we're kind of changing this a little bit, we're just gonna use result data dot ID uh, to do that. All search results uh, that aren't summarized in some way, that aren't grouped or summed or something like that, will have uh, the internal ID. It's actually not a column you need to specify, unless like we do in this case, we're sorting it or doing something else with it. Okay, so all we've done here is take this search result and transform it into a plain JavaScript object with nice descriptive properties rather than, um, you know, a string separated by commas that lives inside an array that lives inside another array. Uh, we just have a nice flat object. Okay. And then, um, really, all I want to do is just take that data. I'm not even sure I need this. And I'm going to push it onto Mac results. So push um, adds that element to the end of the array, to the back of the array. So I am just turning Mac results uh, as I go through each search result. I am popping them, uh, I shouldn't say pop, that's different. I am pushing them onto uh, our, our results array in this object format. Um, so they will no longer be a search result that we have to work with and call get value on. We will just be able to access them through these properties directly. And that's all I need to do. I know there's there's some logic in here for shifting the owner to the front, and I think I want to attack that in a different way. Um, so for now, I'm gonna get rid of all this. Oops, we still need that return true. Okay, so here is our find Mac records. Now, I could do this differently. Um, I, I would, actually, I would do this differently. Um, I think I'm gonna leave it for now. This is okay, right? This will go, this will get us 4,000 results for every single Mac address and uh, translate those 4,000 results into simple objects. 
and spit those out. So if we come back up here and put that function to use, for now, I'm going to do like That's it. So that will, this first search results will be a list of objects representing our Mac record search results. Great. Now, we talked about last time how this code is completely identical to um, the search one processing. Everything is the same. The only difference is right here in this filter value. So instead of running two separate searches, can we somehow combine the two filters? The answer, of course, is yes, we can. So instead of running two different searches and combining the results, let's just run one search that gets all of these. So I'm going to grab, I'm actually going to rip this out. I'm going to grab our filter. And it, it's it, it's like that. And I'll put it on a new line. Put this on a new line. So um, filters allow us to specify expressions like we're already doing. Uh, we're just combining them now. So we have a list of two filters to use. And we want the results where either one is true. It could start with the MAC address, or it could start with uh, an equal sign, a quote, and then the MAC address. Um, and filter expressions let us do that very easily. There we go. There is one search that will get all of the uh, MAC ID records that, e that start with either the MAC address or the prefixed MAC address. And now we don't even have to worry about doing two separate searches. That is all the results we need. So we can totally get rid of all of this. This seems not so relevant anymore. Um, this doesn't really need to be called first search results anymore. Uh, I'm going to search results is very vague. Um, and they're not results anymore. That could be misleading. They're no longer search result objects, although they were certainly derived from search results. They are just objects representing these Mac ID records. Um, I'm going to, we'll keep this, but let's update this a bit. Um, We no longer have any need of hold array or final array. Okay, so really, let's see. It's not quite true. Uh, we could still leverage final array. Okay, we don't need to reset hold array. We definitely don't need hold array. Um, we can leave it called final array. That's okay. And we can output final array. Um, this part, we don't have to manually iterate and copy and all that stuff. We don't have to manually explicitly state this. We can just say array concat um, and that returns a new array so we have to do this. Okay, so that just takes final array and appends uh, this new array to the end of it and kind of combines them into one single array. Um, so we just Update final array with our results every time. And that is all we have to do. Uh, current line, do we ever... Oops. 
I just like to visually separate those sorts of things. Okay. All right. Um, there is definitely a more concise way to express this when you're looking for something blank or empty or invalid. Well, invalid is too generic. Uh, that could mean a lot of things. When you're looking for something that is null or empty like this, uh, there is a more concise way to do this, but it gets into a lot of uh, JavaScript that is a little bit out of scope for this video, I think. Uh, might derail us for quite a while. So, we are reading our parameters. We are reading the MAC addresses from the CSV. And then we are going through and processing them. Now, I'm a little bit unhappy with this section still. I feel like I want this to be just another, like, plain English uh, name to read. And I feel like we can accomplish that somehow. So if I cut this, um, let's see, what are we actually doing with this, with the rest of this? Uh, that's where we're actually, you know, translating, um, Mac addresses into kind of these Mac records. So I'm going to make a function called addresses to objects, I think. And I'm going to So that's I'm I'm just describing in plain English what I want to do, and then I'm going to use that to define the name of my new function. Uh, where do I want to put this one? Right here. Okay, uh, this isn't technically, this needs to be CSV, what do we call this? This is just called CSV right now. I think I want to rename that slightly. Uh, code occurrences. Um... rename that just a little bit so we're taking the raw csv data and translating it into actual objects so final array still gets our results we can just output final array we everything else is defined within this uh, function here Current line is right there, current Mac. We just need to double check that we aren't missing something from the, the context we ripped this out of. So we're not missing something from previously in there. And I don't think we did. Okay. So I'm gonna take this function, and we're gonna call it. Now, certainly you can leave these comments in my hope, my goal usually is to write it so that the function names describe what it's doing and we can minimize the the number of comments uh, in, in terms of the comments that just like state what a line is doing. You should be able to interpret, infer what a line is doing from reading the line and then comments should be for more complicated, complex uh, 
descriptions of what's going on or why something is happening or why you did something a certain way versus or maybe uh, thing other ways you tried to accomplish it and didn't work so that no one comes back later and says oh i think this other way will work and then they go try it and waste a bunch of time that you already spent uh, investigating that okay so we are our csv data it's still called final array here i think i want to call that something different Uh, data to objects gets a CSV, uh, but I want to refactor this. Yeah, Mac records is fine. Um, okay. So now this is a lot more concise. Uh, it's pretty self-explanatory what this does. We set the folder and save the, the file, except dupe list. Uh, this actually needs to move uh, because we define and, and read, we get the file elsewhere, right? We do that inside of read Mac address. So that needs to happen. We actually need to save this file in here instead. Now, you may actually want to wait. Um, it, this is kind of, um, this would be more dependent on the business process uh, as far as like, when do you actually want to save this? What constitutes a completed file? Right now, all we're doing is running a couple searches and then marking the file as complete. We're not waiting for any of the subsequent processing to actually complete. Uh, so that says to me that when this file gets moved into completed folder is doing it, uh, you know, right here versus right here doesn't make much difference. Either way, it's still happening inside of get input data. Um, I have a feeling we might want to wait till summarize to do that, but I don't quite understand enough about, you know, what that completed record or completed folder represents to this business. Um, okay. And that's our get input data. So our get input data, let's compare the two, right? Put them next to each other. So f originally our get input data started on line 104 and went all the way down to 315. No, I'm sorry, 294. So 190 lines of Git input data. And we've now reduced that to um, 12, 13 lines. Now, that code, this, all this code is still there. It's still in this file. So if we go to the bottom, we haven't, like, uh, we haven't made this file a ton shorter necessarily, at least not yet. <laughs> um, that's not the goal, though. The goal was making it more readable. So which one of these is easier to figure out what it's doing? This block? Or that block? Which one is somebody new coming into this project going to figure out faster? Right, so when you come back in here in six months and you're saying you're thinking, hmm, um, something's wrong in the like the parameter value is not getting read at, read correctly. Uh, where does this thing read its parameters from? I could have uh, still added all these script parameters and I could have, uh, you know, this would have stayed the same. I could have added another um, current script at runtime. You know, I could have added this same thing here for the the um, search ID, obviously updating the that. And then I could have come down here and done the same for the folder ID, updating the ID again. I could have done that. But then when you come in here and you say, Okay, uh, the folder ID is not getting read correctly. Where does this thing get the folder ID? You have to come in and you have to like hunt for, I'll have to like come in and do get parameter and like 
Okay, sure, this doesn't take that long. That's not too bad. But the point is they these calls are spread out all over this file as opposed to this, which is like I come in here and on the first line I see, oh, here's where we read the parameters. Let's jump to that. Boom, there's all three of, there's all of my get parameter calls tightly packed right next to each other. And you can say, oh, somebody introduced a typo here and I need to get rid of that and re-upload it. Um, much faster, much better organization. Um, closely, your closely related functionality here is is all right next to each other rather than being spread out, you know, by 150 lines of code that you would have to kind of scroll through or control F through. Um, and you can start imagining as this sort of thing, as your projects get more and more complicated, they get spread out over multiple files. Uh, you, you don't want to be control Fing that. <laughs> you want to have nice, uh, identifiable, locatable functions that tightly pack everything together. Okay, so we have... I, I am fairly happy with get input data. I think we're going to put another cut in here. Um, it's been almost an hour of recording time now. Hopefully I'll trim that down for all of you. But uh, we will come back in the next one and attack the map phase, I think. Maybe. I have some other ideas too. But uh, that's what we'll do next time.